Welcome back to one more stock channel. Today, we are diving into a story of, well, a pretty incredible corporate evolution. We're talking about Rocket Lab, ticker RKLB. It's a big one. It is. Because if you still think of them as just the small rocket company, you are uh, definitely living in the past. You're looking at a 2021 snapshot. Yeah. The business has fundamentally changed. Exactly. So this deep dive is all about that pivot. Our mission today is to really analyze their 2026 strategy. We're focusing on how they're repositioning themselves as a vertically integrated uh, space prime. Right. The question is no longer will they survive. The question now is how big can they get? And all this insight comes from a comprehensive analysis on the One More Money blog. So if you'd rather read it, you can always go to onemoremoney.com and click the link in the description to see the full article. Okay, so let's unpack this. Where did Rocket Lab even start? Well, their roots are all about democratization. It was founded in 2006 by Peter Beck, originally out of New Zealand, but uh, now headquartered in Long Beach, California. And the initial goal was really just making space accessible with their light lift electron rocket. But as you said, that's the old narrative. It's missing the forest for the trees. By late 2025, Rocket Lab isn't some hopeful startup anymore. Not at all. They are an operational workhorse. The numbers really back that up. What are you looking at? As of late 2005, RKLB is the second most frequent launcher in the United States. Second only to SpaceX. Trailing only SpaceX. And they hit 21 successful electron launches in 2025 with, and this is the key part, a 100% mission success rate for the year. Wow. In an industry where reliability is basically currency, that track record is priceless. Exactly. And that reliability paid off big time. You're talking about the U.S. government. Let's talk about the massive contract from the Space Development Agency, the SDA. Yes, the $816 million contract announced in December 2025. This isn't just a big check. It's a designation. It changes their entire character. How so? The SDA is building the U.S. defense satellite architecture in low Earth orbit. And that contract is for RKLB to build and deliver the satellite hardware. So not the launch, the actual satellites. Precisely. It cements them as a critical pillar of U.S. national defense. They are, for all intents and purposes, a defense prime contractor now. That is the ultimate validation, isn't it? It signals that the space economy is evolving. It's moving from just access, you know, the ride, up to utility. But we do once we get there. Exactly. And Rocket Lab's whole strategy seems designed to capture value across that entire stack. Okay, so let's talk about that structure, because their dual-engine business model is what makes them so unique among the public space companies. Right. It's launch services and space systems. Model is split, yeah. Launch services, which is mostly Electron today, that's like the billboard for the company. Okay. It generates some cash flow, sure, but its main strategic value is proving they're reliable and building those relationships that lead to the much bigger contracts. The ones in the other segment. The ones in space systems. And long-term scaling for launch. That all comes down to the neutron rocket. So if launch is the gateway, tell us about space systems. Why is that the real profit engine? Because that segment often brings in more revenue than launch itself, mm -hmm. and the contracts are just bigger in their longer term. That $816 million SDA contract, that's all space systems. Building the satellites, the no, software. All of it. They're building the satellite bus, which is called Photon, the flight software, providing ground support. They are firmly establishing a space-as-a-service model. I find that term fascinating. Space as a service. They build the hardware, provide the components, and then they operate the mission. Which means recurring revenue. It lasts for years after the rocket is gone. So how defensible is that? What's the moat? The moat is what they call the end-to-end -end advantage. Think about it like this. A customer can walk in with just a sensor. And Rocket Lab does the rest? Everything else. They can design the chassis, provide the power and propulsion, write the software, launch it on electron or neutron, and operate it in orbit for you. That seamless integration is the key. You're not managing five different vendors. Exactly. It eliminates complexity and risk. And they built this integration uh, pretty strategically. It wasn't just organic. Right, through acquisitions, like Solero for solar panels. And Sinclair Interplanetary for reaction wheels. These are critical satellite components. So why was controlling the supply chain so important? It was the decisive factor in winning that huge SDA contract. Defense contracts need ironclad guarantees on schedules. No delays. Zero delays. By owning the guts of the satellite, they eliminate reliance on third-party suppliers. They control the timeline. And for the DOD, that is reliability. Okay, so let's talk about the hardware that unlocks the future. 
Let's talk about Neutron. This is the centerpiece of the whole 2026 thesis, right? It's everything. Neutron is a medium lift rocket specifically designed to carry about 13,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Directly targeting the mega constellation market. The market completely dominated by Falcon 9 right now. But its real innovation is in how it approaches reusability. And the most talked about feature there has to be the Hungry Hippo fairing design. Explain that. So traditional rockets, they just jettison the nose cone, the fairing, yeah. and you have to go recover it with boats and nets. It's complex and slow. Right. Neutron's fairing opens like a giant mouth, it releases the payload, and then critically, it stays attached to the first stage. So the whole thing comes back in one piece. One piece. It simplifies the whole turnaround process, which is key for rapid reusability. That sounds great, but... If the fairing stays attached, doesn't that require a much stronger structure? Doesn't that add a lot of mass and stress on reentry? That's a great question. And it does add complexity. Their answer is material science. Neutron is the world's largest carbon composite rocket. So it's lighter and more durable than metal. Exactly. Lighter and more durable than competitors using something like stainless steel. That durability is essential for what Peter Beck wants to do, which is a 24-hour turnaround. And what about the engines, the Archimedes engine? The source material called it the Toyota Corolla of rocket engines, not a Ferrari. What does that mean? Well, the design itself, an oxidizer-rich staged combustion cycle, is actually cutting edge. It's very efficient. Uh, but Rocket Lab's strategy is to operate it conservatively. They are prioritizing reliability and engine lifespan over setting thrust records. To maximize reusability. That's the whole game. Yeah. The hot fire tests in August 2024 validated this. It's all about consistency, not raw power. Now, while Neutron is the future, Electron still has a very lucrative niche, doesn't it? Tell us about Haste. Right. Haste, the hypersonic accelerator suborbital test Electron. It's a modified version of the small rocket. For the Department of Defense. Exactly. For hypersonic testing missions. And since those missions require extreme precision and, you know, confidentiality, RKLB can charge a huge premium. They get great margins, even from their older rocket. Let's pivot to the competition. Neutron is aiming to undercut Falcon 9, targeting about 50 to $55 million a launch. Versus Falcon 9's commercial price of around $67 million. Yeah. So the cost per kilogram is roughly equivalent? Roughly, yeah. yeah. Around three dollars $800 a kilogram. But again, Rocket Lab's key advantage is that vertical integration. Yeah, end-to-end -end service. They can offer a fully bundled service, build the satellite, launch it, operate it, that SpaceX doesn't always prioritize for smaller clients. But the big shadow looming over 2026 is always Starship. If SpaceX gets that working reliably, its sheer size could crush Neutron economically, couldn't it? Starship's cost advantage is undeniable, if it works as planned. But Neutron still has this taxi utility. What do you mean by that? Many defense missions or smaller commercial projects need a specific, timely deployment to a unique orbit. You don't want to wait for a 100-ton Starship to fill up. It's a dedicated ride versus a bus. A perfect analogy. Neutron offers dedication and agility. And what about the other competitor, Relativity Space's Terran R? That's where RKLB's track record is just a decisive edge. As of late 2025, Relativity is still unproven. They have zero orbital track record. Well, RKLB has dozens of successful launches. Dozens. And Relativity is a pure play launch bed. Rocket Lab has those big, high-margin space systems revenues to fall back on if there are delays. It's an ecosystem versus a single product. Okay, so let's validate this entire thesis with the numbers. The story is great, but do the financials back it up? What did Q3 2025 tell us? It told us the integration strategy is already working, even before Neutron is flown. They reported record revenue of $155 million. Which is a massive 48% year-over-year increase. It's a huge jump. But the most important metric for me is profitability. The margins are stunning, especially for an aerospace company that's still pouring money into R&D. They are. Gap gross margins hit a record 37% in Q3. And that's up from being negative not long ago. And Gap is the real, unadjusted number. It's the true measure. It validates that the space systems business isn't just big, it's profitable and it's scalable. And they have incredible revenue visibility, right? That gives them a safety net. A huge one. The backlog swelled to over $1.1 billion before that massive SDA contract was even announced. So that's clear revenue for two to three years. Exactly. Ah. Plus, they ended Q3 with over a billion dollars in cash. That's the war chest they need for Neutron development without having to go back to the market for more money. The market clearly buys the story. The stock's trading near all-time highs, you know, $70, $70, $74 range. But that also means the bar for execution is incredibly high. It is. 
which is why we have to talk about altitude sickness. We have to talk about the risks. Let's start with the most obvious one, neutron execution risk. The maiden flight already slipped to Q1 2026. What happens if it fails? A catastrophic failure would be devastating. It would severely damage the stock, probably trigger a sharp re-rating, and could ground the program for a year or more. The risk isn't just the delay, it's the optics. And on top of that, the valuation premium. You said it's priced for perfection after a 170% run-up in 2025. Any stumble, even a small one, could trigger a 30-40% pullback very, very quickly. We also saw some heavy insider selling in late 2025 from CEO Peter Beck. For a stock that's on fire, doesn't that raise some questions? It absolutely raises a red flag that you as an investor have to acknowledge. Now, selling after huge gains is common. People take profits. Sure. But the amount and the timing could suggest that even management thinks the stock is fully valued today, even if they believe in the long-term mission. It's a signal of short-term caution. Okay, so let's define the future. Looking out to 2026, 2027, what's the base case for Rocket Lab? The base case is just predictable execution. Neutron debuts successfully and gets into a regular launch cadence. Space Systems executes on those big contracts, driving 40%, 50% year-over-year revenue growth. And they approach profitability. Right. They approach gap profitability and solidify their status as the clear, reliable, integrated number two to SpaceX. Okay, what about the bull case? What turns them into a true market leader? For the bull case, Neutron has to work perfectly right yeah. away. It enables a rapid launch cadence that starts pulling business directly from Falcon 9. And they land a huge commercial deal. That's the key. They announce a massive Constellation deployment deal, maybe with someone like Amazon Kuiper or a big international player. Space Systems margins expand beyond 40%. And in that case, they either become a compounding giant? Or an immediate acquisition target for a legacy defense prime that's desperate for what they have. And now for the dreaded bear case. A major neutron failure. A grounding of 12, maybe 18 months. At the same time, Starship finally becomes fully operational and just sucks up all the commercial demand. And what if the government money slows down? That's the other shoe driving. DOD budget cuts delay the SDA contracts. If all that happens, the stock would re-rate drastically, probably falling 50% or more. Clearly, this is not an investment for the faint of heart. Who is the right kind of investor for this? You need a very specific risk tolerance. First, you have to be the SpaceX proxy seeker. Since SpaceX is private, RKLB is the highest quality public peer play on this whole market. Second, you have to be a volatility veteran. You have to be okay with seeing 50% drawdowns. If a sharp drop makes you panic sell, this stock is absolutely not for you. And finally, you have to be a long-term visionary. A long-horizon visionary. This is like a venture capital bet in the public markets. Yeah. A five to 10 year outlook, betting that space infrastructure becomes a multi-trillion dollar economy. That picks and shovels angle seems key. You're not just betting on the rockets, you're betting on the infrastructure. Right, RKLB profits by selling the satellite parts, the solar panels, and the ride. They have multiple ways to win, regardless of whether their customer's specific mission succeeds. That's the right takeaway. Rocket Lab has truly graduated from the startup phase. Absolutely. By hitting 37% gross margins and securing that defense foundation, they've proven the model works at scale. And Neutron is the bridge. 2026 is the year it could take them from a big company to a potential $100 billion space titan over the next decade. But the volatility is simply the price of admission. It's what you pay to own the most capable public space company out there. And that raises a final provocative thought for you, the listener. What's fascinating here is realizing just how essential government contracts are for fueling private enterprise. Consider this. How much slower would commercial space innovation move without that massive foundational layer of defense spending and guaranteed demand? It's a great point to think on. Before we sign off, just a reminder that this analysis is not investment advice. It's based on information from the One More Money blog, and you should always do your own research. Absolutely. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate you diving deep with us today. If you're interested in U.S. stock investment, please be sure to subscribe to the One More Stock channel. That way you won't miss any of our latest videos. And please encourage us by liking and commenting. We'd love to know what you think about this topic. We'll see you again in the next stock analysis. Goodbye.